G'day, Starlo here. Welcome to episode four of my Cutting Edge Fishing Wisdom podcast. Come on, let's go fishing. The hairs on the back of my neck suddenly stood up half a second after my oversized swim bait had splashed into knee-deep water. There'd been a rolling boil and a big swirl several metres beyond it in even shallower water. This was immediately followed by a fast-moving bulge, tracking straight for the slowly sinking lure. I cranked the reel handle fairly quickly three or four times, then paused. As I did, there was an almighty wrench on the braided line. I stabbed the rod up, but its tip stayed down, and the tightly set drag squawked in protest as the rod began to buck in my hands from a series of violent, angry head shakes. The shallows erupted as the hefty predator threw its bulk almost completely clear of the surface. I knew what was coming, and my shaking fingers fumbled to back the drag off. As I did, braid began to pour from the spool in a sustained burst as the hooked fish bolted for the deeper channel out to my left. The fight was on. So, am I recounting hooking a big barramundi in the shallow margins of a northern dam, or perhaps a metre-long threadfin salmon on a tropical sand flat? Nope, it's neither of those. In fact, I'm actually describing exactly the sort of encounter I've experienced multiple times in recent years while chasing one of the most common, widespread and popular estuary and inshore species found in our southern waters, the not-so-humble flathead. But not just any flathead, I'm talking here about the adrenaline-pumping pastime of pursuing big, dusky flathead in skinny water. What do I mean by big? Well, any dusky over 70 centimetres is a nice fish, but these days I don't regard them as truly big until they top about 85 centimetres and weigh more than 10 pounds in the old money. From there on, it starts to get really exciting. Just how large they can potentially grow is a matter of never-ending conjecture, folklore and argument. Certainly a relatively small handful of genuine metre and metre plus dusky flathead are caught and properly measured each year. I call these fish unicorns, and for those of us who hunt big flatties, they're the holy grail, one that most of us will never actually achieve. Meter-long flathead are much rarer than most people are willing to accept. We all know excitable types who've seen half a dozen of them in a morning, or who hook and lose a metery every other weekend, but the fact is, very, very few of those ones that got away would have come anywhere near kissing the genuine 100 centimetre mark on an accurate measuring mat. There are plenty of 80s out there, but a lot less 90s. And when you get over the 95 centimetre mark, (laughs) the numbers plummet. Having said all of that, I'm still willing to accept that there may well be a few genuinely scary freak fish swimming out there somewhere. Duskies of 1.1 or possibly even 1.2 metres in length that weigh as much as 10 kilos or more. Certainly they lurk in the dark depths of my imagination and appear regularly in my dreams, chasing frightened children out of the shallows as they hunt down my hapless lure. Maybe one day I'll actually cross paths with such a beast. Until then, I'm happy to fish in the real world and delighted to call an 80 centimetre flatty a big one. Flathead of one sort or another consistently place in any top five listing of Australia's favourite recreational fishing targets. This is especially true along the eastern seaboard from Queensland to Tasmania. While there are multiple species of flathead living in these waters, it's the dusky flathead that's king along the east coast and with good reason. Duskies are not only abundant and widespread, ranging from the tropics to Bass Strait, they're also the largest members of the clan. Furthermore, they can be caught on everything from a simple hand line baited with a frozen prawn to the most sophisticated of lure and fly gear. In this feature, I want to look specifically at targeting bigger flathead, those crocodiles well over 70 centimetres long, especially while casting lures in shallow water. To me, this is the most exciting form of flathead fishing, and it tends to be at its best from spring through into midsummer and beyond. Exactly when the action peaks depends a bit on where you're fishing, with the best of it happening earlier in the north and later in the south. 
For many anglers, pinning a really big flatty is simply a welcome bonus or a lucky accident that happens very occasionally while they're targeting average fish, be they smaller, eating size, flathead, brim, whiting, estuary perch, or whatever else. If you're really lucky, you might happen to hook into a couple of larger flathead every year while you're chasing those other things. Just occasionally, perhaps once every few seasons at most, one of those bigger flatties might be a genuine unicorn in the 85 to 95 centimetre plus range. In my opinion, and it's one based on years of careful observation, these rather sporadic and haphazard crop captures don't truly reflect the relative and growing abundance of bigger flathead in many of our estuary systems. I believe that there are a lot more of these special fish out there than are being hooked. For me, the take-home message from this is the fact that really big flathead are no pushover. They're a specialist target, just like Mulloway. Anglers who deliberately set out to find and catch them and who tailor their gear and techniques accordingly will encounter a lot more big flathead than generalist, scattergun, whatever comes along type fishers. This is a lesson I've learned the hard way because for a big chunk of my life, I was one of those people who didn't catch many big flatties. But now I've seen the light. So how do we effectively target these bigger flatheads? One of the simplest ways to increase your strike rate on larger crocs is to upsize your lure. If you normally use 60 to 100 millimeter offerings, start by shifting up to 150 millimeters or even more. Don't be afraid to go big. I've seen 80 centimeter duskies swallow good size whiting and even try to snaffle smaller flatties half their own length. So upsizing definitely works. Sure, you may catch a few less smaller fish <laughs> and your brim bycatch will definitely dwindle, but I guarantee you'll encounter more large flathead and dewies as a result of going bigger. While it works on many fish, the other standout Aussie species that responds particularly well to upsized baits and lures is the mighty Murray Cod of our inland waterways. I firmly believe that with both Murray Cod and Flatties, the single most important step you can take to boost the number of strikes registered from larger specimens is to significantly increase the size of whatever it is you're throwing at them. There's just something about larger prey items that pushes their buttons. The fact that the biggest flathead or Murray cod in any system are mostly seen by casual anglers when these whoppers suddenly materialise and try to eat something smaller that's already been hooked simply reinforces this message. These peak predators prefer and actively seek out larger prey items. So think big. The other interesting parallel between big flathead and large Murray cod is the fact that both fish spend a lot more time hunting in considerably shallower water than you might expect. There are three main reasons for this behaviour. Firstly, larger fish have less to fear from predators, especially birds, than smaller ones do, so they're less cautious about entering the shallows. Secondly, shallower areas heat up quicker on sunny days and large predators regularly seek out warmer water to increase their metabolic rate, just like the lizards and crocodiles that Big Flathead get their nicknames from. Finally, there's often simply more food in the shallows than there is out in deeper water. Think about this shallow water phenomenon for a moment and let it really sink in. It may seem counterintuitive at first glance, especially if you were raised on popular notions of searching for those legendary deep holes when chasing big fish of any type. The truth is that a lot of very large fish spend much more time in shallow water than many people realise. At least as importantly, if they're in shallow water, they're likely to be actively hunting for food. Sure, Big Cod, Mulloway or Flathead will lie up and rest in those legendary deep holes, but often they're relatively inactive and therefore harder to catch while they're in those spots. By contrast, fish hunting in the shallows are switched on, fired up and usually catchable. Of course, shallow is a comparative term. If you're chasing Mulloway or Murray Cod, it could mean fishing in 2 to 4 metres of water instead of the more traditional 5 to 10 metres and more. But for Flathead, it can mean focusing on the really shallow stuff, literally ankle to waist deep water. It's amazing how much time Dusky Flathead, both big and not so big, will spend up in this super skinny water. After all, there's lots of tucker in there, and as a bonus, generally much less boat traffic and less fishing pressure. For unicorn-sized flathead, I firmly believe that the shallows are where it's at, especially in spring, summer and early autumn, when the water's warm and the flats are alive with mullet, 
herring, whiting, brim, garfish, silver biddies, prawns and heaps of other prime tucker. Naturally enough, fish are easily spooked out of such skinny water, but I've also observed that big flathead in particular will often return to the same shallow areas within 20 minutes to an hour of being scared out into deeper water. There's simply too much food and warmth there for them to ignore. As a bonus, for those of us who hunt them, they also regularly leave a calling card as they exit the shallows in the form of a distinctive divot in the sand or mud called a flathead lie. And no, a flathead lie doesn't mean catching an 87 centimetre fish and telling your mate that it was a metre long. These lies or marks are a dead giveaway to the presence and preferred ambush stations of flathead, as well as their orientation, typically facing into the tidal flow. Carefully note the exact location, on your GPS if necessary, of any larger lies and come back in an hour or so, on the next tide, the next day, next week, next season, whatever, and work that spot over thoroughly. There's nothing new about this little trick. The legendary flathead Fred Bays was using it to deadly effect on his favourite Gippsland and southern New South Wales waters decades ago. It still works today. Putting these lessons about big lures and shallow water together moved me a lot closer to unlocking the secret to pinning those unicorns on a far more regular basis. However, the final critical piece in this puzzle finally fell into place for me during 2017 when I read a magazine column by Queensland fishing writer and renowned trauma surgeon David Green. Greeny's column detailed a technique pioneered by a handful of switched on southeast Queensland estuary fishers who were targeting jumbo flathead with great success in shallow water, mostly while using oversized soft stick baits. Reading David Green's writings made me sit up, take notice and reassess the big flathead conundrum. It got the mental cogs grinding and I was inspired. To cut a long story short, I fiddled about in the tackle room that afternoon, rigging giant squidgies whip baits unweighted on various jig hooks with treble stinger hooks attached and pinned into the lure's bellies. The end products looked ridiculously huge, but they also looked like they just might work. Next morning I hit the water and motored to a suitable flat where I'd been seeing but not catching some solid duskies over the previous few days. I deployed the bow mounted electric motor and spent the first four or five casts nutting out the specific retrieve Greeny had described in his column. And on my sixth cast of the session, a fat, fit 78 centimetre lizard burst from the sand and violently nailed the jumbo lure. It's not every day you receive such instantaneous and positive feedback on a new technique. Since that breakthrough moment, courtesy of David Green and his mates, I've played around a hell of a lot more with this rather radical technique, adding a few of my own little twists and wrinkles and fine-tuning things along the way. The results have been nothing short of spectacular. Alongside the rapid development of techniques based around these oversized, unweighted or lightly weighted soft plastics, has come a parallel boom in the use of hard-bodied swim baits, glide baits, wake baits, surface lures and shallow running floating diving minnows to target croc-sized flathead in shallow water. Suffice to say it's produced a boom fishery and more keen anglers are getting on board every year. Meanwhile, lure makers are scrambling to keep up with all the developments and the demand. The actual methods for using both soft and hard offerings in these scenarios are almost identical. They involve quiet, stealthy approaches to productive flats and drop-offs at times when boat traffic and people pressure are at their lightest, followed by long casts up into shallow water. Of course, you can also replicate these presentations in reverse while walking and wading, and I've had some great results fishing land-based, so don't feel at all disadvantaged if you don't have a boat or a kayak. The best actual retrieve to use with these lures varies from style to style and model to model, but basically you need to be imitating a feeding or injured fish up on the flats, one that's either preoccupied or incapacitated and therefore more susceptible to the smash and grab ambush methods of a big croc. Times and tides can obviously be important too, and the long-standing preference of most experienced flathead chasers to intensively focus on the last two hours of the run out and the first hour of the run in make a very good starting point. But to be honest with you, I'll take a quiet, still morning with few other anglers out and about and a water temperature over 20 degrees in preference to a perfect tide any day of the week. 
Having said that, tidal flow will dictate the orientation of any flathead lying in wait. They will always face into any flow or current, and they typically expect their prey to be either travelling with the flow or across it. Effectively attacking a concealed flathead with a lure that suddenly emerges from directly behind it or straight overhead is a great way to spook them. Bear this in mind when lining up your drifts, walks or wades. And if you're wading, be as quiet as you possibly can. I use both bait caster and spin tackle to target jumbo flathead in shallow water on lures. Both styles of gear work well. Personally, I love the added control an overhead reel provides when fighting big, powerful fish, but there's no doubt that a spinning outfit offers greater flexibility and ease of use, especially if you need to punch bulky, relatively lightweight lures into any sort of breeze. You don't need heavy gear, huge line capacities or super sophisticated drag systems to handle even the largest of flathead. Standard 2000 to 4000 size thread line or spinning reels are perfect, especially when matched up to 2 to 2.2 metre spin sticks. Make sure your rod has enough poke and backbone, not only to cast big bulky lures, but also to set hooks in hard fish jaws, sometimes at long range. For this task, I'd rather a rod that was a tad too stiff than one that's soft and sloppy in the tip. I normally run 10 or 15 pound braid as my main line. You could certainly go lighter, but as this outfit is also my weapon of choice for targeting mulloway, I'd rather a margin of safety. Keeping fight time short also reduces stress to the fish, making for better post-release survival rates. Braid of this rated strength is skinny and casts well, but it has the authority to dictate terms to any fish likely to be encountered in these scenarios. Leader construction is important too. Because we're dealing with shallow and often very clear water, I believe there's a significant advantage in maintaining a reasonable degree of separation between the more visible braid and the lure. I'd never use less than a full rod length of leader for this caper, and I actually prefer two or even three rod lengths at times. That means casting the connecting knot off your spool on every throw, so that knot needs to be as slim, compact and unobtrusive as possible. My preference here is for an FG knot, but a well-tied and closely trimmed Slim Beauty, Double Uni or even an Albright will do the job. Tie the knots you know best and trust completely. Because the leader knot is being cast off the spool, I don't like to go too heavy with my choice of leader material. I find that 6 to 8 kilo clear fluorocarbon or nylon is fine for the task and enhances the finesse and subtlety of the whole presentation. To prevent big flathead chewing or soaring through that relatively fine leader, I invariably add a short bite tippet of 10 to 15 kilo material, either clear nylon or fluorocarbon, and then tie my lures to this. This bite tippet only needs to be 20 to 30 centimetres long at most, and could be connected to the main leader with a small black swivel, a small solid ring, or preferably a compact, trustworthy knot like a well tied Albright. Seriously large flathead are special, valuable creatures. Despite some damaging misinformation that has done the rounds over the years, they are not infertile like your grandma. In fact, they produce massive quantities of eggs each year. Yeah, they're all females. And the bulk of those eggs are perfectly viable. This makes them super breeders and incredibly important to the future of our sport. Catch and release is really the only way to go. But oversized flathead are also just a little bit scary. Their weight and sheer strength comes as a shock to many anglers as they thrash wildly in a knotless net or on the deck of a boat. They can quite easily cause nasty injuries with their teeth or gill cover spikes and especially with any swinging hooks. They can also hurt themselves badly at this stage, dislodging scales, splitting fins, damaging eyes and so on. Having a game plan in place and the right tools at hand minimises all of these risks to you and the fish. Make sure you have that big knotless net, some soft gloves and long nose pliers handy and only ever place these fish on damp marine carpet or a wet towel, never a hard dry deck. You can use lip grippers, but I'm not a huge fan, as too many people treat these things as handles to throw fish around and hold them up, often damaging their jaws and internals in the process. If you do choose to use one, use it with care and support the fish's weight at all times with a hand under its belly. Once a big flatty is safely contained in a large landing net, keep her in the water while you get yourself organised to unhook, measure, photograph and release the catch. 
Once the fish has been unhooked, hold it in the water by the bottom jaw, facing into any current. Don't push it back and forth, just face it into the flow and allow it to recover its strength. This is another good opportunity to snap a few more photos. Chances are the big flatty will soon bite down hard on your gloved hand and kick strongly. At that point, simply release your grip and allow the fish to swim away. I guarantee that what you'll be feeling at that moment is one of the greatest highs in fishing. Of course, there's so much more I could tell you about the many nuances of targeting XOS flathead in skinny water on lures, but I've simply run out of space and time here, and I do apologise for that. However, I've written an entire ebook on the subject called Chasing Unicorns, and you'll find a link to it hereabouts. If you're serious about your croc hunting, I strongly recommend you get hold of a copy. There's a lot to know, a lot to learn, and many pieces still to add to the evolving picture all of which I find rather exciting. Who would have ever guessed that the humble dusky flathead could provide us with so much entertainment and so many wonderful challenges? Long live the mighty croc. Be sure to check out all the content on my Starlow Gets Real YouTube channel, as well as my Starlow's Fishatopia Facebook page and Instagram account. And if you'd like to help me produce more instructional content like this in the future, please consider buying me a coffee or shouting me a beer. Just go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Starlow to find out how. Until next time, tight lines.